Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, I haven't got an accordion, but I will do the best I can. Um, I I'm amazed at you guys. Uh, you've had a very, very busy day. You're obviously still fizzing to go, and you've exhausted being night. That, that takes some doing. I've known Dean for some time. So thank you so much for what you're doing. It will help us in feeding to our project. Um, Sir Tiffany O'Regan and I are chairs of what's called the Constitutional Advisory Panel. And we were set up about a year ago by the government to consider constitutional issues. Now, they have not called it a review. They called it a consideration of constitutional issues. But in fact, it is a review. And since that's easier to say, that's what I'm going to call it. <laughs> uh, why was it set up? Uh, one answer we sometimes get is because it was in the agreement between the government and the Maori Party. Now, that's not a reason. That's a historical fact. But the reason simply is, why would you not want occasionally to review your constitution? Uh, we review all other sorts of law we have, eventually. New Zealand's very slow about reviewing things. So, for example, there's, there's an au Auctioneers Act in force, but this is 1928. It defines an auction as something that takes place in a room with people raising their hands in response to a call from the auctioneer. Telephone bids? No. Internet bids? No. So at last they'd say after 70 odd years, time we review it, and they're doing it. So if you can review minutiae like, like that, why would you not review your constitution, which underpins the whole thing? Uh, we were asked the other day, we went to interview a group, and they said, can you assure us this is a serious exercise? And both Sir Tiffany and I said, we wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't serious. And even if you didn't intend it to be serious, we are making it serious. So something will happen as a result of this. Now, the philosophy behind the review is an interesting one. Uh, the government says constitutions are not imposed on people. They're not pointy-headed intellectuals or politicians imposing things on people. Constitutions belong to the people. And before there's any serious change, there has to be general public approval for the change. Now, some people have cynically said that means nothing will ever happen because you'll never get agreement. I don't think that's right. When time moves on, when you see things are lagging behind, people do want change. And I think there will be some agreement about at least some things in our mandate. We're a panel of 12 people. Uh, we represent the philosophy that the Constitution is for the people. We're quite a diverse group, there's 12 of us. We're from all over the country. A great range of occupations and interests. There's educationists, there's business people, there's former mayors, there's former cabinet ministers, former politicians. So we're quite a varied lot of people. Uh, only two of us are lawyers, and I regret to say that I'm one of them. The other is Peter Chen, the former mayor of, uh, of Dunedin. And that perhaps tells us constitutions are not just about the law, and nor should they be. Uh, our other task is simply to consult New Zealanders about what they think. We're asking New Zealanders, what do you know about the Constitution? What do you think needs to be done? Now, that's a formidable task. Our mandate is to consult all New Zealanders. Do you think that's possible? Probably not. But we're giving it a jolly good go. And the way we're doing it is by talking to very large groups, which have a lot of members, people like the Law Society, the Rugby Union, if you please, trade unions, education institutes. And we've so far talked to about 50 very large groups and I tell you what, we have been absolutely excited by the enthusiasm they've shown. We didn't know what we'd strike when we walked into this, but almost all the groups have said we would love to help, we'll distribute material, we'll organise functions, and we'll make sure our members know about it. Now that was better than I would ever have anticipated. So this, this is going to work. And look at this gathering tonight. Uh, you'll be feeding too into what we do. And the enthusiasm you people are showing uh, is, is something to behold. It's just, it's just great. Uh, one of our problems, if we have any, and I think we do, but this is one of them, uh, is that our terms of reference are slightly strange. We've been asked to look at eight issues, and we've been told that other issues might arise, and we can then ask the ministers that we can look at those as well. But the eight issues are only sort of part of the Constitution. They're not a whole Constitution at all. And they start at fairly second order stuff, like, for example, how many MPs should you have in Parliament? That's one of our eight issues. How big should the electorates be? Now, those are pretty much second order questions. They, they don't go to the fundamentals of anything. But then you rise up through Bill of Rights, should we do something about that? To the big questions, 
And one of the big ones is the role of the Treaty of Waitangi in our developing New Zealand. Really big question. Probably our biggest question, I think. Once the settlements are complete, in this diverse population we now have, which is changing by the year, population demography, what's the relationship building role of the treaty in this new world? Really important question. And the other big one, and as a lawyer I love it, uh, what about a written constitution? Uh, you may draft such a good one in the next day or so that we'll simply adopt it and say, job's done. <laughs> um, and I, and I, hope, I hope we can do that. But our job is not to get bogged down in the UTI because there's a real risk we might do that. Uh, we've got to see through the whole, of, the whole picture and say, what should a constitution be about? And there's a number of really big issues we've not been asked to look at. Uh, balance between local and central government. And that's a huge question. There's now an enormous Auckland Greater Council. They're talking about it in Wellington. So Geoffrey Palmer is on a panel looking at that question. If you get great big local councils like that, are we possibly moving back to an era of provincial government? And what's the role of central government in that? We, we live in Christchurch, so to be and I, and we've suffered from the earthquake as many others have. Our central government is operating in a big way down there. CERA is a government department, and it's helping our council, or standing beside the council, as a city is, is redeveloped. So what's the role of central government in local government? Really big question, developing question, and we haven't been asked that question. But people may come up with it. Uh, controls on power. Keeping the executive in order. Parliament does it and does it quite well with MMP. Uh, perhaps didn't do it so well before that. But what about things like the relationship between a minister and his or her government department? Uh, is that a proper balance at the moment? And I know that's a really big issue that some former state servants are quite interested in. Uh, what should the relationship be between a minister and his or her department? Well, let me get on very briefly now in conclusion to my favourite topic as a lawyer, written constitutions. Why would you want one? Two very good reasons. Because they educate people. Now, if you try and talk to school kids now about the constitution, you have to dip into a whole lot of buckets. The statutes here, there's a treaty over here, there's cabinet manual here. Very hard to teach a young person what the constitution is. But if you've got a written constitution of a lot of simple, clear propositions, much easier to educate people on it. I think the other reason, perhaps connected with it, is it makes you distill principle. Now, I've heard it said that an English or New Zealand-based lawyer wouldn't know a principle if they fell out of it. Our law is very, very detailed. Our statutes are very long. Tumbles of words all over the place. Uh, cases are much the same. What we need to be able to do is to distill from all that massive information the principles. Now, we've got an informa Official Information Act and our commission, the Law Commission, which I'm on, has just reviewed it. It's a 66-page detailed act, but it's based on a wonderfully simple proposition. Government should be open and transparent and should talk to the people. Now, if you put that in the Constitution, you can see at a glance what all that's about. So, by writing these things down, you can certainly see what the basis of your Constitution is. And it's things like democracy, the independence of the judiciary, the rule of law. In other words, the government is subject to the law like everybody else. So you can distill all those things. What are the downsides? There's a big one. And it is that if you write things down in an act of parliament or in a, a written document and you give it some clout, <coughs> you entrench it perhaps, the lawyers and the courts will be all over it. And that is a serious problem. <coughs> I don't think you can ensure yourself against it. Uh, the Bill of Rights is a lovely, simple document, a beautiful document, which states our rights and freedoms in just a few pages. The right to freedom of expression, the right to freedom of movement, and so on. And none of that's new. You're just writing down what existed for centuries. But the jurisprudence that's created in the courts is so complicated that when I lectured to classes on it some years ago, I used to groan as I went into the room, will they ever understand this? Um, why is that? Because it's so important because you want to get the right answer. And to get the right answer sometimes takes a lot of judicial time. But I do think it's unfortunate that that's one of the downsides of, of writing things down. Then you've got some questions, and I'm sure you're considering them now. Um, what sort of constitution do you want? Detailed or principled? 
I mean, you could have a very detailed one. You could bundle together the Official Information Act and the Privacy Act and the Electoral Act, and you need a, a, a moving truck to cut it around town with hundreds of volumes. But you don't want that. You want a much simpler one. So the question is, what do you put in, what do you leave out? How much detail goes out to one side in ordinary statutes, and how much principle do you put in the Constitution? That, that's a real balance. And then, what is a constitutional question? Which means, how do you define constitution? Is privacy a constitutional issue? It involves the relationship between a person and the state, but do you want that in a constitution or not? I don't know. And a critical question, should the Treaty of Waitangi go in the constitution? I think many people would say, what more fundamental constitutional document is there? Of course it should go in. Others would say, no, it is prior to any constitution. The constitution flows from it, and it should stand as a very special document on its own. So these are issues I'm sure you'll be talking about tomorrow. <coughs> Another big question is, how are you going to pass this thing if you get it in the Constitution? We just get Parliament to do it? Because if you do, they might disagree on some of it. And if there's anything controversial, they probably will. So do you have a special devised process, and if so, what is it, for passing a Constitution of the law? We, have, we haven't done this before. Other countries have, and we might be able to learn from them. And let me conclude by saying, don't expect ever too much from the Constitution. You have got to have one, uh, fundamental to our society, fundamental to our law, and they make us what we are. But don't expect too much. For a start, a Constitution is words on a bit of paper. I can write anything on a piece of paper, but to make it work, it's got to go deeper than that. Uh, let me read you something from the Constitution of a well-known country. Here's just two clauses. This country is a democratic, popular, socialist state. And here's Article 25. Nice ringing terms. It says, freedom is a sacred right. The state protects the personal freedom of citizens and safeguards their dignity and security. Citizens are equal before the law in their rights and duties. Now, which country is that? The answer is Syria. <laughs> so I tell you, everybody wants to look well on paper. Constitutions have to go into your bones. They've got to become part of you. And so Tiffany, in his talk this morning, talked about the culture of the Constitution. That's more important than any words on a piece of paper. Writing it down doesn't do much. You've got to live it. It's got to be a part of you. And the other thing a Constitution can't do is it can't find a government money. Now, if I asked my children and grandchildren, how would you want this country to look in 2050? They'd probably say, we all want jobs and good housing. Uh, a constitution may help in that. It's a very nice question whether it does. But to do those things, you've got, the government's got to have some money. And if there is a global economic crisis, which will affect New Zealand, I'm not sure how you ensure that. So that, again, goes to the question, what do you put on the piece of paper? Um, is it just what we might call jurisprudential rights, or is it economic and social rights as well? Because some of those do cost, I'm afraid. Well, in conclusion, thank you so much for doing the work you're doing. Uh, we very much look forward to the outcome. And I have greatly admire your enthusiasm, which is far more than I could have mustered in any stage in my life. So it's very nice talking to you. Thank you.